Maybe I'll just start with the um, introduction and then we'll get into, uh, we'll have Ingrid introduced and uh, let her take take the microphone, okay? Um, so thank you to everyone you. who's joined so far. Um, like to, uh, first of all, welcome Ingrid Boudet from Toronto, uh, originally Vancouver. Um, and uh, we'll have her speaking in a moment. Also, uh, I'd like to mention the co-host here, Elvira Lount, um, who with the Keep Kids Wild Society, I think it's called. Um, uh, and Jan, May is, J Jan Mays as well, uh, are core members of the Vancouver Noise Task Force, which we uh, declared into existence just a year ago. Um, so I'll just describe that briefly. Uh, so uh, my name is Randy Helton. Uh, I am, uh, I've been, uh, I guess, an environmental activist for a few decades. Um, and I, um, my main thing is translation ja of Japanese on environmental topics uh, as a freelance translator. Um, and 10 or 14 years ago, started City Hall Watch as kind of a watchdog for uh, all kinds of policy at City of Vancouver. Um, and we just try to uh, analyze policy and support the grassroots. We really believe in the power and the wisdom of communities. And uh, noise is kind of a new topic for us, uh, but it's a very important topic. And uh, we'd like to just support, um, uh, you know, bringing people together on a topic here. Uh, let's see. Also, I should gratefully acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge uh, some of the people here today are from the Right to Quiet Society based in Vancouver uh, with a uh, with decades of track record of dealing with the, the policy of the city of Vancouver. And uh, I think much of what we see in the policy uh, in Vancouver, city of Vancouver is um, a result of their work over the years of very uh, professional advocacy on behalf of the public. Uh, so we have some of them here today as well. Uh, Let's see, I also would like to acknowledge our ears. Uh, it is a, such a wonderful gift to have, have to be able to hear at all. Uh, and so that's kind of the basis of our discussion for today. Uh, so gratitude for our, our ability to hear. Um, the science around noise and health uh, is growing and we know more than ever about how important having a good audio environment is for our own for our lives, uh, mental and physical well-being. Um, and I also, from just observing how things go, I'm no expert in sound policy, but it is very clear that there are trade-offs between uh, total total quiet and you know sounds of birds uh, versus absolute complete noise of construction and sirens and things like that. So a big question for policymakers is where in the middle uh, should the balance be be had? Uh, and I look forward to hearing, or we all look forward to hearing from Ingrid about uh, her thoughts on that. So I think that's about it for the introduction here. Um, for today, we are going, we've got a, we've got one hour to one o'clock. We'll do a soft close. Uh, if people need to, to end five minutes before one o'clock, then at, the official end is at one uh, Vancouver time. But uh, if people would like to stay a little longer, we could probably hang on if people still have more things to, to uh, comment on. Uh, so that is that. And so uh, we'll start off with uh, Ingrid to speak. Uh, I've asked her to do her own self-introduction because she knows herself better than I know her. Uh, in fact, we only met for the first time just today, a few minutes ago. Uh, so, um, and Ingrid will speak. She's got a bit of a presentation that will open up for a free discussion. Uh, I'll just moderate a little bit with the help of Elvira. Uh, so if you have questions, um, please feel free to uh, use the, the hand button to raise your hand uh, or on the screen and I'll just uh, direct to tra for the traffic flow. Um, also, um, there's just no time for everyone to do self-introduction, but we'd appreciate if you would like to, uh, to use the chat uh, even right now uh, or in the next few minutes, just to say, if you'd like to say, um, uh, give your name, where you are, and um, your organization, if you're with one, uh, and any particular sound-related or noise-related issues that you uh, think about. And then we'll just hang on to the chat later to uh, make a summary report of the meeting. Right. I also, also mentioned that it's uh, recording is on right now, uh, and just depending on how it goes, we, uh, we may release the video later. Uh, if you don't want to be on a video, then uh, you could just uh, turn off your video 
Uh, but you're also very welcome, since it's a virtual meeting, you're very welcome to put your video on and participate as if we're all together in a room. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you for your patience. And now I'd like to pass it over to Ingrid. Uh, the show is yours, and I'll open the share screen too. Awesome. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, it is just so uh, lovely to to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation. <clears throat> um, I, As I was saying earlier, I grew up in Vancouver. I grew up in Richmond, rode my bike on Granville Avenue and Granville Street to Prospect Point Cafe, worked there, and I also skied on the North Shore Mountains. I was a ski patroller at Cyprus. I lived in Whistler. So um, I, am, I, I believe that actually my upbringing um, was a really big part of my relationship to sound now. I used to have a, um, a touring business. Um, I speak German. And um, I used to guide German tourists through the mountains of British Columbia. And so I was for a significant part of my life, well, I don't know, three, four years, literally either on a mountaintop or in the forests and didn't was not surrounded by combustion engines. And I heard spring. Um, I, you know, when you're when you're in the forest and there's still that heavy snow and you hear the water drops. Um, when I was skiing down the down the um, hills at Sun Peaks is where I was a ski patroller as well. And um, when when it's cold and clear and the snow creates surface hoar, which is basically all of those feathers that stand up from the Scott from the snow, um, I was skiing through those and it sounded like a chandelier breaking. And it was like, wow, this is this is incredible that all of those little little flakes can make such a sound. And that stayed with me. What also stayed with me was that I was up on the mountaintop and in the valley were the snowmobiles. <laughs> and they just, we were nowhere near each other. And yet they impacted my soundscape. They impacted my enjoyment. I could no longer hear that breaking chandelier. Um, and so so I think that's that's kind of like, if I have an origin story, that's probably it. Uh, my Toronto origin story is um, I've been living in the same place for 10 years and I live close to the Gardner Expressway and also an arterial road. And I've been living here um, for a long time and I used to ride my bike to downtown Toronto. I lived, I chose where I live because it's as West Coast as possible. So I rode my bike to downtown Toronto to work and then I would come home and have a little nap on the balcony. And I literally am 150 meters away from the Gardner. But it was this white noise. Fine. You can I could tune it out, wasn't worried about it. Then in 2019, pre-COVID, I started to hear this, but 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 but, you know, and, and it was like, what 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 is that? Like it was an ugly sound. It impacted my um, I'm just I is sorry. I just saw my internet go. Um, so it impacted my soundscape and I had no control over it. And I was like, what's this? And I was like, okay, whatever. Well, and then we had COVID that, that, that the pandemic that, that hit us all and impacted many of us. And so I actually um, was, we, everybody was sent home working from home. So here we are working from home. And what happened was that I heard vehicles now at night the racers and the street uh, the the street racers basically had discovered the empty streets and i started to get woken up and intermittent and it constantly i'm trying to work we here we are trying to work from home and between having everybody at home we're trying to focus and then we have this random vehicles and it's really hard to not go who is that what's what's going on right so it was constantly sapping my capacity to focus um, certainly impacted my sleep. And so I, one night, one, one motorcycle woke me up and I was like, okay, what time is it? I have one of these watches that tells me everything. And I was listening and I timed it and I heard it for 10 minutes and it wasn't going particularly fast. It was just, you know, and so I looked at Google maps, what 10 minutes would be away from my condo because I could hear it and I could hear it kind of go down into a little dip and come back up and then go on an overpass that is visually in my sight from my condo, I can see this. And so I knew kind of where it was and I was like, how 10 minutes was seven kilometers away. And I was like, wow, so that's one engine in my, that is a drop in my soundscape. What happens when all the cars come back? And there's thousands of them. Many of us had discovered we could hear birds from our condos. We suddenly could sleep with the windows open. We suddenly had 
it was like the world kind of opened up. In fact, the world moved less. I don't know if you guys know that, but actually on the Richter scales, it is clearly shown March 20th, boom, the, the, the vibration of the earth reduced. So here I had this vehicle and I was like, okay, so it woke me up. How many other people did it wake up? And I started to get angry because we have no defense against sound. It is actually the first sense we develop. We hear our mother's heartbeat. We hear her breathing. And if anybody has ever said goodbye to a loved one, the nurses will tell you it's also the last sense we lose. So we have no defense. We are actually tuned to listen. And back to Randy's introduction, we're thankful for our ears because there's people who don't listen or can't listen, I should say. And boy, don't they have a different world to navigate. So we really should be thankful for our ears and our listening capabilities. Um, however damaged they might be when we're teenagers and we had our Walkmans or now I'm dating myself, uh, but now is the earbuds, right? So we're thankful for our hearing. And so when I, when I looked at this and I thought this was not only impacting my hearing and this, it was impacting my sleep. I was getting angry. So I started to do some research and city of Toronto, Public Health did research studies in 2016, and they published them in 2017. And uh, one of them was called as How Loud is Too Loud? And that's when I looked at the heat maps of what the, what the sound levels looked like. And it said that I lived with 90 decibels as a weekly average, 80 to 90 decibels, right? There's always a, a spectrum there. And 80 to 90 decibels on a 24 hour average. And I was like, yeah, but you know what? I don't live with an average. I live with what you see behind me. I live with spikes. We all do. None of us live with an average. I take sound level measurements in the in the forest. Believe me, the birds at five o'clock in the morning, they, they produce something a little bit like this. Um, so I looked at that and I was like, wow, okay, this, this doesn't make sense. And also, so the data that I was seeing didn't reflect my personal experience. When I tried to log the noise reports, with 311, that process didn't work either because they wanted a license plate, they wanted a picture, they wanted a description of the car. Um, and I'm like, it's three in the morning, I'm in bed. So that was, so we're told to call 311 for everything. So boom, I did that. And then they would open my case, close my case. And then they'd say, well, actually it's a moving vehicle. So it's the responsibility of Toronto Police Services. Call them. Oh, great. So I do that. They only have an online portal. They don't have an app. And then I tried to do that and literally nothing because in the opening of, of where you log the report, they wanted a picture, they wanted a license plate. And it's like, the process doesn't work. So I was being impacted. I have a history of stroke in my family and noise produces ischemic heart disease and stroke uh, or can, can lead to that. So I started to get angry and I was looking at this going, the process is broken. The data is incorrect. So what is Ingrid going to do? And so I bought a sound level meter. I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna figure out what I, what do I live with? And um, that's when I discovered somebody, I started ranting about this. So I went onto Twitter on, in a, an anonymous account and I was like, is anybody else really angry about this? Well, turns out I wasn't alone, but they, everybody thought they were alone. And so that's where creating community is really important. Um, so I'm not alone. The data's not right, the process doesn't work. So I bought a sound level meter and um, I started measuring sound and I started getting results like this. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that's why. So what you see behind me is actually a measurement from the gardener, but you'll see how I need to figure this out. Over here, the noise actually, the, the ambient sound level goes up. That's because I was on a balcony when they closed the gardener for a triathlon, for an event. And then that is when they opened it or there we go, that's when they opened it. So that was the difference. And I was like, oh, when you take away that high level average, it suddenly starts to show all of these spikes. So these spikes you see are six, seven, five o'clock in the morning. That's impactful. And that's impactful at night when we're supposed to be resting and recovering and healing our bodies and our minds for that matter. So started collecting data started to um and the other thing that happened was in the first year of um covid i took an introductory gis course from growing up in bc i could pour over maps forever and try and find out how would i go from a to b and see that waterfall and hike around that glacier and all that stuff 
Um, and so I started, I took an introductory GIS course and I worked for a company by the name of Terranet, which manages the land registry database for the province of Ontario. So that's where it started to, my, my mapping desire warmed up a little bit. And when I took this GIS course, I saw that through the Esri, so they introduced me to Esri functionality, I saw that I could build a survey that people could fill in on their phone, a noise report, and they could see that dot on the map and they could see their dot along with everybody else's. And when I was thinking about how do you create community? Well, we like to complain. This process doesn't work. So see what I can do. And so that's what created the Not 311 noise report. And um, and so that's been going on. I've got over 11,000. I'll show you briefly. Uh, 319. Okay. So, um, so that is what started kind of getting this ball rolling and taking a data-centered approach because it's the, the saying is if you don't have data then all you have is an opinion and many of us have been trying to fight noise decade like for a long time right to quiet and we had the um we have the uh, toronto noise coalition here they've been trying for decades but it was more of an opinion than fact and now we have data so um a friend introduced, uh, sent me a, a webinar for Dr. Tor Oyamo, who is a professor at Toronto Metropolitan University and a world health, health expert on noise. Um, we also had the noise bylaw review. And that was, um, you can have the best idea, the best product, but if it's not going to land in, a, in an environment that's conducive to that, you can push a long time for a great idea or a great product and it'll never take off. Well, we had the noise by law review. Uh, so I was like, okay, uh, it doesn't get much better than this. We've got a noise by law review. I'm collecting data. We're collecting points. Uh, we're creating a community. Let's see what we can do. Um, and so I started to depute. I started to learn about the civic engagement process. And it's opaque and it's not easy. You know, um, agenda items come up on a meeting schedule a week in advance then you can have on that committee meeting you can have 14 items and if you want to register to speak you register to speak on an agenda item you don't know how many people else are registered to speak if it's two or 20 or 100 um so then you register to speak you look at the agenda item and then on that day is when you can either go online or virtually now, thanks to the pandemic, we now have a virtual option, but you go there and on that day, if there's 14 items, they may cruise through eight of them right initially. If there's no discussion or there's no speakers, boom, 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 you're out. So suddenly the, the order is all wrong. And then they go back to items with speakers or that have more discussion. And so literally people have to take a whole day off if they want to make a deputation or speak to the committee. And I've learned that that is the best way to make a difference. There's email campaigns, there's other ways to do it. But for January 11th uh, was when we had the big noise bylaw implementation review. By then no more noise had been created and I'd started to create an online community. And what I did was I educated the, the educate public educate people who are interested in noise who are affected by noise many don't know of the health impacts educate elected officials um talk to your counselor all that kind of stuff so then on january 11th we had 40 people register to make deputations i was blown away because often um I, I would say that like when it comes to bike lanes or development or homeless people or the libraries was also a really big one. You could have hundreds of people like tens, twenties, hundreds of deputations. Apparently the public library ones went on for a very long time, but I had 40 and these were 40 brand new people that had never really made deputations before. I coached them. I, ho I hosted um, no more noise uh, meetups where we talked about it. Some people were just willing to wing it. Some people wanted a lot of prep. But those made the biggest difference because people could see the impact that noise has on people's health and on their mental well-being. They saw tears. They saw frustration. They saw um, somebody with autism literally try to get it out of their system. They had somebody somebody who was blind who said, hey, you know, um, noise impacts how I my noise muffles the cues. I need to navigate my city. 
And the louder it gets, the worse it is. And so here's somebody who already has barriers to their activities of daily living, and they have more. And people with autism, people with cere cerebral palsy, all of these people are impacted even more. So noise is a health issue. It's an equity issue. It's also a climate issue. Um, because when people modify their vehicles, that circumvents the, the, um, the emission controls. And that's what changed here in 2019. Doug Ford took away drive clean. And that was where every year or every other year, whatever, you had to have your um, um, exhaust inspected. Well, you take that away. That was the last visual inspection of a vehicle. And so now it's a free for all here in Toronto. I mean, the 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 straight pipes on the motorcycles, the I got a picture of a motorcycle with four mufflers on it. Nothing comes stock like that. Um, and then, I mean, we've all heard the vehicles. And so I also get Google alerts. Toronto's not the only city. Vancouver's not the only city. Collectively, we have gotten louder. The, the, the planet has gotten louder. And I think it's partly because we've been told for years, ah, oh, it's noise. It's a sign of a growing economy. You'll get used to it. You know, and now the construction people and housing people are saying, well, we need houses, we need construction. Yeah, but the people that are living around constant construction are losing their minds. We're going bonkers. And in Toronto here and during the during the pandemic, they allowed 24 seven garbage pickup. And I have video now of garbage trucks, 107 decibels. Every time they bang that bin back, imagine being woken up by that four times a week, multiple times a night. Like we, we all know what it feels like when you don't have a good sleep. And that's that's the thing. So, um, so we had 40 people depute, that made a difference. What we had then was a counselor who wasn't even on that committee basically made a motion from city council floor saying clearly noise is an issue that we need to work on more. I'm that, and this was councillor Sachs, who is, um, um, I won't go into the wards here in Toronto, but councillor Sachs put a motion forward saying clearly this needs some more work. We request that municipal licensing and standards, which is the bylaw enforcement group work with community groups, such as no more noise Toronto to continue working on this. I leapt for joy when I heard that. I was I was just like, and honestly, tears. I'm a bit of a teary person sometimes. And I was like, oh my goodness, look at this. This is amazing. She actually also bought a sound level meter and I'm managing that for her because she's an environmental lawyer. She knows data, data, and you, and you have to collect data before you actually need to present it. So that's where I've been collecting sound level meter data now for two and a half, almost three years. In July, it'll be three years. I also collect crowdsource data. And I'll give you a quick example of that. I'm just minding the time because I want to allow time for questions. So you guys can ask me anything when I uh, when when we come back, but I'm going to quickly run you through my website because um, people, first, you need to engage the public so that you get a community. I have 1,300 people on my newsletter. I didn't know if that was good or not. Apparently, other organizations say, yeah, if you got 1,300 people in eight months, that's pretty good. Um, and then I have a number of followers on Twitter and Facebook and all that. Social media is not my strength, but it's kind of one of those things that you need to do. So um, I'm going to pop over to my website. So I'm going to be looking away from the camera here. So apologies for that. I'm, yeah, I can see that you can see my screen. Okay, so here is my website, nomorenoisetoronto.com. And I'm sharing this with you because... Um, I use, I have somebody that does my website for me, but then each one of these is actually a story map, which is Esri functionality. And what that means is I own, so um, I own the content and I manage the content behind each one of these pieces. And if I had to ask for my web developer to do an update every time, I think we would both be hating each other because I update a lot and you need to, right? You need to keep it current. So um I've got my socials up here. You can, you guys can see all of this. So what I just did was we finally got a logo. I hope you like it. The little heart with headphones. We are, we are protecting our heart mostly from noise. Um, our brains in there too, but, um, so what people need to know is they need to know what's coming up so they can plan and also what they can do now. So I'm just going to click into here. So each one of these is its own. And so this is where I have a little timeline where people can get to. So this is what I'm doing tonight. I'm holding a meetup 
to talk to people about how to speak to the Board of Health on July 8th. And this is where if I can duplicate what we did in on January 11th, um, if I can have 40 people depute, I will be on the moon, maybe beyond the moon. It'll be amazing. So this is what I'm doing, no more noise meetups, and then also City of Toronto committee meetings. So this is where on July 4th, this community, this group is actually meeting on the night on the night economy manifesto. So I know you guys are talking about night economy and culture and music. So um, ask me questions about that, okay? Um, and so that's just an example of what is on my, um, so what people need to know right at the top, people's attention spans, <laughs> they're, they're, they're this big. Um, and so I look at my stats, people look at websites for less than a minute. So I try and keep, I try and surface everything really high up. So people were asking me phone apps. What can, what can I do? I have a sound level thing right in my phone. What can I do? Well, click on this. And then here you go, you can, um, this is my example of my favorite for, so here's the garbage truck, 107 decibels. So I take this, I take this um, data with Smarter Noise Pro. It has the video, audio, and decibels all in one. Phones are not the best because they're meant to capture our, our conversation and eliminate background noise, but it's still something. Um, and so then there's others. I've got one for Android and then another one for, for iPhone as well. So you need to surface information really high up. Um, and um, I'm just going to show you quickly my not 311 noise report. So this is where um, we are over 11,400 and that was on June 15th. So we're probably good at getting close to 12,000 noise reports. And it's just coming up here. So this is where, again, this is Esri technology because sound is so specific to location. So that's why I thought this was just a really good um, um, thing, uh, good relationship. So here you can zoom in to different areas of Toronto and understand the hotspots. Um, and then I also have a dashboard. What created the noise? What day of the week is more noisy? Because again, how many times have we all filled in surveys? And we don't know how we rank amongst everybody else. We don't know what the results are. So part of this is if I ask people, the public for information, that information will become public. That is my, that is my commitment there. Um, so municipal licensing and standards, notice this. I talk about data, I talk about process. So what we did here was they actually asked me from based on this not 311 noise report, they basically said, Ingrid, you know, we want to do enforcement blitzes with Toronto Police Services. So we want to find out where the locations are that we should do illegal muffler inspection blitzes. So I literally I'm showing you guys this first because I'm sending this off to City of Toronto um, later, uh, probably tomorrow. But this is a um, couple little bit of preamble here. So what it is, is I actually created a survey that was open from May 16th to June 24th, and it produced over 800 submissions from people. And this is what it looks like. So the not 311 noise report is the red dots. The green dots are from the survey that I only had open for two weeks, and I did it on a timeline. And this, you'll see this, this little area here explodes because I gave every single counselor a little blurb to put in their newsletter and only one counselor did it. And that was counselor Chang. And up here, it just explodes. She had her, she had her uh, newsletter go out on the 29th and on the 30th, it blows up. So to me, this is actually representative of the problem in, in of the noise problem in Toronto. If every counselor would have done that, I bet you every ward would have had a hotspot like that. So, um, Really quick, what's happening now is I am actually just building a new website, a new web page that's going to go right in the middle between here. Top, front, and center is the Toronto Public Health Strategic Priorities. They've been, they are determining their four-year strategic priorities right now. And while the city bylaw is important, that is enforcement. That means the noise has happened. That means the health impacts have occurred. That means our soundscape has been polluted. So health, health is about prevention and noise has been studied in the workplace. So I'm a worker, I have hearing protection. I suddenly leave the work site, I no longer have hearing protection. I no longer have protection over my health. So whose job is it? And I pointed the finger, I said, it's their job. 
And so um, they've been doing their four-year strategic priorities. I've been getting people to depute. We've had about 12 different deputations to this strategic committee, and now they're releasing it to the Board of Health. And so that's the big meeting that's happening on July 8th. And so here's for, for an example. So a little bit of preamble on the left. And then initially, so based on our deputations, they changed the, the priorities and they included well-being across the lifespan and they, to advocate to advance health equity. And to me, this is where noise is. So what I'm going to do, like tonight, is actually go through each one of these, except the last one, pro positive workplace culture. That's a that's a TPH thing. But these four, I'm going to give people speaking points on how noise fits under each one of them. And then they can choose to do, share their story however they want, but then we have a unified message across the board. I'm also doing, so I'm going to stop sharing there. Um, I'm now also doing a media event. I have never done a media event before, but on July 8th at 8.45 in the morning, I have got Councillor Sachs, who I mentioned already, and Councillor Chang, who sent out that stuff in her email, in her newsletter, her my survey in her newsletter. We are going to hold a conference, and I'm going to be inviting a couple specific residents to speak about how noise impacts them. And that's going to be from 8.45 to 9.15. And then a whole bunch of us are going to go in and start and, and depute on July 8th at the meeting starts at 930. So it's going to be a big rocking day for No More Noise Toronto, but I am excited. Um, I've done most of what I do scared in a way because it's new. I've learned out loud. I've dropped people off of Zoom calls. <laughs> Randy and I had a little bit of an exchange beforehand. This is what it takes, though. It takes bringing people together. Being vulnerable, I think, is also important. Um, and being honest. And people are so honest with me. They tell me about how angry they are. They tell me about their broken relationships. They tell me about their mental anguish. And while I haven't been paid a cent for this, I have never been so rewarded and so fulfilled in my life. Uh, we survive by donations. And um, I'm looking now for grants and do I incorporate and there's all kinds of other questions that are coming up, but noise has legs in any city. It's just a matter of how you do it. And um, I'm very happy to be invited here and to share with you and the, the members in the audience. Thank you for taking time because you're taking time out of your lunch hour. And um, our time is our most precious resource. And so I thank you for that. And I think with that, I will stop and answer questions and let's do whatever's next. Okay, thank you very much, Ingrid. That's really awesome. Um, I was interested in um... A video you did recently where you actually had uh, people from the city of Toronto on with like staff from the city responsible for noise policy uh, mm. with you and actually participating and very, very proactively, you know, cooperatively uh, discussing things with you. So that's quite something. Um, we actually invited the city of Vancouver to join this event today. Uh, I sent a couple, I sent a reminder in the invitation and one reminder didn't get a reply. So uh, uh, and also, they just did a, a bylaw review, a noise bylaw review. Um, they got 200 or more responses from the public, which raised a lot of concerns you would expect as a normal citizen. Um, but the focus seems to be more on how to uh, promote uh, music events and so on, and, and perhaps weaken uh, noise controls regarding construction and so on. So I think we have work here, but um, so maybe if uh that's one thing i'm i'd like to ask or I, i'm very impressed with how you're able to get a positive response from the local government there um how I, that work? I, I i was amazed i was absolutely amazed and i think partly um what it is is yeah yeah i i i felt very um afraid because I was pointing fingers. I was pointing fingers at councillors. I was pointing fingers at city, at the city. I was pointing fingers at 311. I've got a workflow about how 311 doesn't work for moving vehicles. And um, what I've heard is that city, and Carlton Grant actually mentioned this in the webinar that you're referring to. He said, cities learn from stakeholder engagement. Okay, but that means cities also need to be listening. And what I would say is at least, and I was, I'll, I'll go back to that, addressing the committee process or the uh, speaking deputations is what we call them. Other cities call them delegations. Um, that got a lot of attention. 
um and 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 going in person while i've deputed online well when i'm done i log off my computer and i and i and i'm not there but when you're in person people see you people see you see them you see the interactions you see all this behind the scenes and people of those 40 people that deputed on january 11th some of them were online but if you don't turn your camera on guess what they're doing they at least in toronto they start looking at their phones so if you depute online, you have to have um, your camera on in order to be effective, but really being in person and being in person is tough because you don't even know where you're going to be on the agenda, you know, so it, it literally requires people to take a day off and then they don't know if the city's listening or not. So go in person, start to establish relationships. And, and one thing that I did that made a difference, because we have this night economy review. So same thing that you guys are doing. They had a guy who, so, um, Construction is very well organized. Um, clubs are and restaurants are well organized. Um, what else was I was going to say? Um, thinking of another noise source, but they these oh automotive automotive um, people they're all very well organized. Noise people we are not organized. We're not all together. So that's where I started to do this collaborative welcoming approach. And what I did in the night economy review, I deputed to that. So the other thing is find everything in your city's agenda and council meetings that can do with noise. Noise is health. Noise is healthy aging. Noise is economy. Noise is construction. Noise is planning and housing. Noise is equity. Noise is accessibility. Noise is our breath. It literally is. Noise is the equivalent of somebody blowing secondhand smoke into your face. Right. So show up, show up often. And what I did at the night economy was I went and I sat down beside one of these club owners that had already been in contact and has already been talking to the city. So I was like, I looked at him and I was like, look at you, look at you go around and socialize. So I plunked myself down beside him and I said, hi, my name's Ingrid. I like to dance. I like to have a good time, but I also want to have a good sleep. And he was like, wow, it, nobody's ever done that, you know, from the other side. So it's about creating alliances. It's about doing that. And the city watched me do that because in those meetings, it's flooded by city people. And I've learned a lot of city people look at city hall. We can watch um, the city of Toronto has a YouTube channel. So you can watch any committee meeting. People do that all the time. They're city junkies kind of, they always watch. But, but also for some of them, it makes a difference in their in their work. So that's that's how you start to get in and um be friendly be nice be easy to work with interesting well thank you um i just as a also as context um i'm gonna I, then i'm gonna hand it over to elvira if you could um moderate the discussion because i gotta help coach someone to get in uh but just okay. one last thing is just for context um i just did i just looked online uh so city of vancouver or city of toronto uh population is about 2.7 million 2.8 million Mm -hmm. uh, and Metro Toronto, 6.4 million approximately, apparently, according uh -huh. to this. Um, city of Vancouver is uh, seven, about 700,000 population, and then Metro Vancouver is about 2.7 million. Um, and so there's different levels of government involved. There's City of Vancouver, there's Vancouver Coastal Health, which covers a lot of health issues, and there's mm -hmm. a Metro Vancouver government, as well as each individual municipality in the region of, of 21 or more. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different governance levels involved. Uh, but the people with ears are another constituency, which I think needs to organize as you're, as you're, uh, you know, encouraging. But if um, I can pass it to Elvira, and then I'm going to go support somebody to get online here. Okay, thank you. So uh, following along with that, Ingrid, what what's happened is that phase two, uh, the phase one noise bylaw review, people were allowed to um, speak and send in um, their opinions and everything. Now we're in phase two, and there is no option for any kind of input to to the city during this phase. They're going to hire a audiologist to um, basically work um, with stakeholders. But who are the stakeholders? Like you said, there's the clubs, there's the restaurants, there's the um, people who want to you know play their music at the beach, the festivals. Everybody except the audience and the people who go to those restaurants who want to go to the parks and not have to always have um, music playing so they're not you know they 
their stakeholders are limited to the people who are going to benefit from what they're doing, not not to the rest of us. So um, not that, you know, we don't like to go to these festivals and uh, but we don't need to have them all the time and there need to be there needs to be enforcement. Um, and I just wanted to quickly bring up three examples recently of the lack of enforcement and the lack of response and Kit's pool just had a pop up patio bar, um, which looks very nice and welcoming, other than the fact that when they and they got licensed to have live music during alcohol hours on Friday, Saturday and Sunday. But the rest of the time they're playing amplified music through a speaker. So if you want to go and they claim they've been permitted, I wrote to the park board to find out I have had no response. So I can't believe that they've been permitted for to have a, amplified music playing all the time. Then on Greek day, um, the the sound levels of, from the stage are was much worse than ever encountered. They were up in, um, you know, the um, 107 range um, at one point. So from 77 to 107. And the bass was was turned up so loud, I, it was deafening. And that, that's never been the case at Greek days before. And there was a guy outside the Hollywood theater with an amplifier and um, <clears throat> playing um, techno pop um, for everybody. And then the third example, a local restaurant near Kitts Beach, outdoor speakers aren't allowed. There, there, there was an outdoor speaker and uh, they always have it on their patio. So you can't go by that corner without hearing their music. So. If this is the direction the city wants to go in in the next stage, which is regulating noise for commercial premises and arts and special events, and they're only dealing with these stakeholders, how can we um, try to engage the city to listen to us, to listen to the concerns so that there is some kind of balance that they are going to have enforcement and they will respond. Yeah. And it's really hard. Like you keep knocking on the door and you try and be nice and, and you're sending emails and it just goes into a vacuum, right? It's it's very frustrating. Um I <laughs> so so what I'm gonna say is you gotta make noise. Um and that's where I think what what started here was just the volume of participants so i i when i was doing my homework i was looking at at this um at that the, the, you're going to have an acoustical engineer and they're going to involve the stakeholders one of the things that i have done is i use i i try and use as much software as i can to knit everything together and so i use new mode to do email campaigns and that was one way that I that I really got attention, and especially of the um, three one one make noise for quiet. It's a bit difficult for us. I know it. Is, <laughs> it, it I just looking at the chat. It is difficult, and um, and so the challenge. Um, what I have found is is that I want to find I want to amplify our voice. So I'm doing that by trying to find a lot of different ways that people can fit in on a spectrum of engagement. So the fact that people, the people that are here right now, you guys are like, you know, four out of five. Um, the people that read that 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 registered but couldn't make it. Okay, maybe there are three. They then they've got other different um, kind of conflicts. Two is maybe they would only maybe send an email or something like that. And one is literally just passively watching and seeing what's going on. And, and I've got all of them. I've got people who have um, probably joined four or five No More Noise Toronto meetups and they've never come on camera and they've never said anything, but they come. And it's like, okay. So the, you just got all these different spectrums, different places. So you need to find ways to get people involved and then to push. And then, so how do you push? You push by showing up, but also consider... Um, New Mode, Action Network, I think Lead Now is another one, or even a change.org. But get your voice out there and get people to come together on one thing and then focus. People are, like a lot of people will sometimes um, ask me, they'll go, well, what about the provincial laws? What about federal laws? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to get a win in Toronto. Focus. Um, and that's where I have, I've reached out to some councillors and they know me. Um, I go to events, I introduce myself, 
Um, that is, you, you got to get in people's faces and then get in their inboxes. So the three one one thing, um, I, I I used to be an executive assistant, and I know that there's people that have assistants, and those assistants manage everything, and they don't get anything in their inbox. Well, I got things in their inbox. I introduced when I introduced myself to Gary York in the city council chambers, and I was terrified to do so because I knew that I landed a whole bunch of emails in his inbox that he didn't want, didn't know what to do with. Um, but he listened, and they he was the first one when I said to him, I said the three one one process is broken. He goes, well, how is it broken? And I gave him my ideas, and he, and I said, Gary, and the the other thing is is that he's bringing in Salesforce, so he's bringing in new. Um, software, which is highly configurable. I know what that's like because I configured Workday. And um, and I said, we have, a, I have a group that would love to meet with you, that would love to help you. And he goes, well, let's do that. I'll have a webinar with you guys. And I was, I cried. I cried in front of this guy. I was like, will you do that for me? And for us? And he was like, yeah. And April 2nd was when we had that first webinar, you know? So, you just got to keep pushing and being out there in person. And then if you can get a, a show how many people are engaged with you that get them engaged and then show them how engaged they are. And then if you can't collect data, buy some sound level meters and put them on people's balconies. People can't refuse that. Can I jump back in? I'm back. <laughs> yeah, I think I've been listening. I've just I was coaching someone who had a hard time getting in. But uh, you're in there, in there now. It happens. Uh, so it's um, we got uh, ten minutes before the official end. Uh, so I was wondering if um, we could do some uh, rapid fire Q and A. Uh, so uh, maybe if Ilver doesn't mind, doesn't mind if uh, if anyone else would like to ask a quick question and we get rapid responses from Ingrid, and then That'd we can fun. go a bit over time for those who are able to remain. Okay. So anyone would like to raise their hand or speak out? I see Jan, your hand up there. You're muted. Yeah, I'm trying to, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if this is a rapid fire question, but when I've reviewed different noise bylaws, I've noticed that um, the cities are um, using occupational type measurement settings and not using the public health settings used by the World Health Organization. Um, so I'm wondering if um, you, like your website doesn't need guidance on that, but then part two, um, do you compare your data to say the World Health Organization noise limits um, for like community noise, night noise, environmental noise? Because um, I know with the Vancouver noise bylaws, the the limits that they allow are well in excess of um, what is recommended for sleep, for speech communication access, for hearing health. Absolutely. Um, so your your first question about the um... <laughs> I always forget the first question, but that yeah, the was the sound level meter settings, sound level meter settings. Yeah, exactly. So we always go to the World Health Organization. Um, okay. The thing is, is that when um, if I were to say so, one of the things that I'm debating on, because what Toronto Public Health could do is establish daytime and nighttime maximums, you know, and we've been told all along that we'll get used to noise. Well, we don't. And those physical health impacts, it doesn't matter if you're annoyed or not. 55 decibels is 55 decibels on our body. But imagine if Toronto Public Health came in and said, OK, everybody, 55 decibels maximum during the day, 45 at night. That would just set rockets off for some people because they would not. They'd be like, we'll never get there. A vehicle going down the road can produce 70 decibels. So it's it's a question of what you ask for. So it's a bit of a dance, but it's always World Health Organization is the gold standard. And when I go over the data with my with, with people that I have taken measurements from, I always say World Health Organization suggests 45 decibels for sleep and you are 20, 30. Like there, there's some peoples where their averages are 70 decibels. They never, ever even get to 55. So yes, World Health Organization standard, gold standard. Anybody else like to raise a hand, ask a question? I'll just speak to, um, there's a Samantha here who's uh, interested in hearing health and safe listening. There is a lot of um, new energy around that, especially due to amplified sound. So there was somebody that I was talking with who likes going to parties and like they're in their 20s. Um, and they say, oh, well, when we, when we go to concerts, we wear earplugs. 
oh okay so it's funny how there is a there is a movement now to protect our hearing but that is that is not protecting us from the source there's people who aren't wearing earplugs when sirens go down the street at a hundred decibels and you are literally 20 10 meters away we're not wearing earplugs all the time so um hearing health and safe listening is is a super interesting um area kits i love kits kits is such a beautiful area yeah cars and trucks with huge engines we have that here in toronto too yeah you see maria there um has a major topic about noise at the PNE amphitheater. Um, maybe Maria, if you're on, if you'd like to ask a question, but keep in mind the time, it'll have to be a short answer for today. Very well. Maria, are you there? And I think Vicky has a hand up. Maria, are you there? Let's see. Maybe let's go to Vicky then. Vicky? Hi, Ingrid. Thanks uh, for all your work here. It is a Big uphill climb for residents, for sure. Um, I would love to live at Kitts Point, where it is actually quite quiet. In East Vancouver, we're really exposed to the industrial heartland of our city. And uh, I live just um, east of Clark or Knight Street, where all the port traffic goes up by truck. So uh, I guess a question around the work that you've done related to entities that don't have elected officials and and don't really have a, a front door to residents. So we have the Port of Vancouver here, which is slated to double its volumes, um, which are largely carried by truck out of our center to highways. So any thoughts on um, mobilizing uh, to get support by the city and other, you know, um, maybe provincial bodies to lobby those groups or hold them to some account? Um, and then uh, just one last piece is around um, some of the monitoring you were talking about, sound meters. I'm really interested in that. The adjacent neighborhood here are doing some air quality monitoring related to some of the seniors' health, especially, but inner city residents. So, um, yeah, are there funders for that? Uh, how does that work? Yeah. So um, I'm just going to, I'm just looking, copying a um, quick thing in the into the chat here. So I, the meters that I use are from Convergence Instruments. Um, they're a Quebec uh, manufacturer and they are one of the most inexpensive, but even then a non-Wi-Fi uh, meter is about $600. So um, funding for that, I, I residents associations are actually, they foot the bill for me buying 10 of them. So you can get you can get information that way and get some help that way. Or you just do a GoFundMe or something like that. Like be creative. Um, but when it comes to these like trucks, we have the same thing. And the thing is, is that we have a few arterial roads going through Toronto and everything goes on them. And I mean, they're massive these days. They're, like the trucks are just getting bigger. So again, I, I were, how I am planning on tackling that is getting a win in Toronto, whatever that looks like. And so for me right now, that is that noise becomes a strategic objective. Um, so that, so Toronto Public Health says their priorities, then they're going to have objectives and then they're going to build work plans. And to me, this is where Toronto Public Health could possibly start to say, hey, we need to look at the noise that comes from our streets because most noise comes from transportation. And let's see what we can do to reduce that. And that mandate then towards possibly, you know, uh, permitting vehicles in the city is one way of doing it, but also provincial and federal. And so that's where I'm focused on wins in Toronto, but I am absolutely, I know motor vehicles is going to go provincial because they're provincially mandated. And then federally, there's the noise standard 1106, um, which is that vehicles should be test built. If they're built in Canada, they're tested um, for 80 decibels. And that is, um, and, and imports are applied to that as well. So where is this falling down? So I would, my suggestion would be to go and look up, look to the provincial mandate is noise anywhere in the um, British Columbia Environmental Protection Act. And it is not, I know it is not in the um, federal. So um, yeah, so th that would be my uh, my responses there. Thank you, Ingrid. Um, now I think Maria's unmuted. So um, maybe Maria and then Victoria. 
And it just like uh, just before they start, um, we got a few minutes left before one. So some people uh, probably have to leave at one. So you're you're welcome to go. Um, and we will do a report on the website and uh, send an email to everyone as well. And uh, hopefully you have a recording as well. So uh, thank you for those who have to leave early. So let's go to Maria and uh, please un unmute and speak. And then we'll have Victoria and then anyone else. And we go over time as well for those who can remain. Hi, Maria? Uh, can, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Oh, excellent. So I'm on my computer computer and I don't have my camera. I don't have a camera on my computer, but I, I just, yeah. um, I just wanted to say, Ingrid, I saw you speak at, at the committee and I heard all the speakers um, and I was going to watch all of them. And it was really um, heartfelt what those people um, go through. And I noticed that you got their attention and they knew about you and good on you for doing that. <laughs> and thank you so much. Um, anyways, uh, what um, Elvira has been talking about the people in around um, the uh, Penny site in Hastings Park has been going through for many, many years. We've endured uh, amplified noise, um, the bass and everything. Unfortunately, the PE self monitors and takes noise complaints. And I have done an FOI, a, a freedom of it, um, to uh, figure out what's this agreement. And uh, uh, PE staff have told people that I phone in to complain about uh, concert noise that the noise bylaw didn't apply to, to them. Mm -hmm. The PE is not following their bylaws. You know, there's all this. Um, so um, we have a 10,000 capacity amphitheater. There's a roof and they talk about the state of the art sound system, but they don't talk about that uh, touring bands add their own sound system. And, uh, uh, and uh, another thing too is uh, the applause is not uh, covered under the noise bylaw. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, so, um, mm. so, you know, and the uh, the is an, an enigma mm -hmm. on purpose. People are frustrated, but they do not understand the peony and they do not understand how to advocate for themselves, how to voice. They go to the peony and it goes into the void, like you, you were saying. So um, my task, I'm not a very good speaker uh, and I, I don't know how to put myself out there. But um, I'm hoping with the help of Randy that I can um, do something because um, this is a 103.7 million uh, amphitheater and it was uh, it was supposed to be a 6.6 .6 million amphitheater with concerts basically just around the fair, like two weeks or whatever, you know, including the fair. Now it's year round concerts. Mm -hmm. it, uh, the audience is covered. It has a roof. Anyways, this is all, and it's 103.7 million. It was supposed to be 6.6 .6 million. And it was all done. They deviated with public, without um, local um, consultation. And mm -hmm. the consultation was done via a survey citywide. And this is what we're up against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 not easy. And especially when you've got so that's where we've got a group here called Live Nation. And they do a lot of concerts, they do bands, they do all this stuff and amplified music has changed. So I like to have a good time. And I make sure the night economy people know that. And I actually ran into one of them at a bar, which was just amazing. Um, but I was going to a concert. And I took my phone and I took my sound level measurements and the bass was a um, hundred. I was up in the balcony. It was a hundred decibels at 31.5 Hertz. Every single cell of my body was moving. And then when they stopped, I was like, Oh, that was a workout. And that I don't recall five or 10 years ago. And it's this electronic music, right? Because you can't get that out of a guitar, no matter how much you amplify it. But you can certainly get it out of out of this amplified um, out of this amplified music, and so it's not only an auditory experience for the audience; it's a physical one. And I'm just going to tie that back into vehicles because apparently every time they go, bah, 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 they hear that and they feel that in their car. 
And so it's about this whole body sensation experience. And there's a whole bunch of other psychology with the vehicle. I see um, Paul Paul had a comment in there about the noise cameras and stuff like that. And um, it's um, amplified sounds. It's a, it's a difficult one. And I don't think that we will actually be able to win on. Um, for me, it's all about the time. I'm going to say like they might be like they shouldn't be very loud. But again, picking your battles, I would rather they're loud and then at 11 o'clock, shut it down on like Monday, like Sunday night to Thursday night at 11 o'clock done. The, the residents can sleep because that's what we are entitled to. We are entitled to a good night's sleep. Um, but still, that doesn't mean to say that that solves the problem. Um, but there have there are structures in place that were made by the powers that be to circumvent all of this, so that they can do what they want to do to make the, to make the money. And we have my saying is is that we have prioritized corporate wealth and expediency over public health. And that's what needs to change. And that's, again, going back to Toronto Public Health, we need to start looking to look at each law and enforce and to do base enforcement on arbitrary numbers for whatever reason. Um, to me, we should always come from the prospect of health because a healthy economy is a growing economy, is a productive economy, is a happy economy and is a happy community. Um, and I know when I'm not healthy, I'm not happy. And there's a lot of people, I was riding my bike today and there was somebody yelling, swearing into a cell phone and I passed by so many homeless people and it was just like, oh my goodness, we're, 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 we're shredding at the edges, you know? Um, and I think we have a certain capacity for noise. And if we weren't subjected to this all the time, maybe we'd have capacity for some of the other more human centered noises. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry, that probably didn't give you a very good answer there, but <laughs> no, um, I just I just wanted to say, and I don't want to take much of your time. Uh, the acoustical report that they first submitted was appalling, mm -hmm. and, and uh, people complained. And then they have the um, at 79 um, decibels, and the report says may and and can and and. Uh, um, it, it's it's I, I just don't know how the public can tolerate this, but this is was all done very covert. Yeah. Any, so now's the time. Now's the time to speak up, get organized, and as somebody said, get loud for quiet. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, some sometime soon with Maria. Uh, I'm hoping we can organize an online uh, meeting mm -hmm. of people to talk about that issue of the uh, PE uh, amphitheater. So uh, anyone is interested, please. Uh, please contact us. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a few things in the uh, chat there, um, which I hope we can get to if we can go a little bit more over time. But sure. also Victoria Gibson had a hand up. So Victoria. There. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. Um, I live right near a SkyTrain station. Mm. Also, there are building a what looks like it's going to be six to eight story condo building right behind my house. If I opened my window right now, I wouldn't be able to talk to you. Yes. The occupation, I, first of all, I started becoming really interested in the audio um, when I was studying the physics of sound in university. And I learned a lot about physics and I learned a lot about sound. Mm. I'm an audio engineer and a musician. My wow. hearing is really important to me. So uh, when I started working out in New Westminster, I started going to the New Westminster SkyTrain station. There's over 120 dB in that SkyTrain station. It's been designed without any consideration whatsoever to the mm -hmm. audio, how loud it amplifies. It's a concrete amplifier for that sound. And then they had the nerve to put a children's play area in one of the loudest places, like little children's furniture and stuff for children to play in. Mm. And children's ears, of course, are way more sensitive. So I was appalled. But I don't live in New Westminster, so I can't. I work there, but I, I can't apply to them because I don't live there. But now they're going to redevelop the Broadway SkyTrain station, which is on my block. It's just down here. And they're going to build a three building cluster that you know what Mississauga looks like? That's what it looks like. 
So they're moving Mississauga to Vancouver. Oh no! Right across the street from my house. Oh no! Yes, and they want to put this little tiny walkway right next to the SkyTrain as the public amenity where there's going to be a concrete building. The SkyTrain noise is going to bounce off that concrete building, bounce, 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 bounce. It's going to have standing waves that are going to be like 150 decibels. And they had the nerve at a public meeting to say, well, we're going to show movies. I said, are, how are you going to stop the SkyTrain for the movie? Oh, we're not going to do that. Oh, yeah, right. I, it's just like there's no zero, zero remediation. Yeah. And and the thing is, is also the workman's compensation board levels for hearing. I'm surprised that every worker in Vancouver is not deaf because they're so high. The levels are so high before they have to wear hearing protection. And 85? Is it 85 decibels? I think it's 90. Yeah. Oh, it's 85 or 90. But the thing is, is I'm here with my window closed and I'm still getting significant decibels so i've had to rent a studio it's mm. it's costing me a lot of money i don't have but i can't work here anymore like all my studio is usually my house but now i can't do it yeah and you know are they going to compensate me no yeah. and then they're going to build right across the other way like right now they're building here as soon as this is done they're going to start over there yeah. and that's going to be a huge project it's going to be massively noisy even worse than this one. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't matter where you move in Vancouver, there's a construction right next to you. Yeah. They're tearing down the entire city and rebuilding it. They don't care about heritage at all. And the current mayor and council that we have is just gung ho. Uh, you know, they don't care about any of the details like human beings dying of COVID or, you know, things like that. Like, yeah. Those it, are details. Go for the money, you know. <laughs> it's it's about changing the culture and how we look at sound. It's kind of like uh, it's a new secondhand smoke, you know, and it's like how we would never think about going into a restaurant where people are smoking. Well, that was the norm, what, 30, 40 years ago? You know, I remember flying in a plane with my parents from Vancouver to Hawaii and there were people smoking in the back of the plane like that just seems ludicrous. So there is a culture shift and I would say that all of us are on the beginning of that wave and it's up to us with the quiet communities and the right to quiet and the noise coalition and the noise pollution clearinghouse and all of us to work together to to start to make this change and um it, it I look at it I mean cuz it's climate it's equity it's it's health Either we're going to make a really good progress in the next five years or it's going to literally fall on deaf ears and, you know, there will be nowhere that we can move. And, and I, I, I at that point, I don't have a solution, but I do know that if we do nothing, nothing's going to change. So that's what keeps me going every day. Yes. Elvira, well, I see that you have your up. hand up. Sorry. Just sign, oh. sign me up. I will help. I, can <laughs> do, I have a constellation of media production skills. Yay! Okay. We need people like you. That's great. Thank I need so people like you. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Who was that that said that? <laughs> Victoria? That's Victoria. Victoria. Okay. Great. Great. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a great, good idea for those of us who want to meet soon to carry on this discussion amongst ourselves and and see what we can do with what's coming out of here. Um, but I wanted to get back to this Broadway plan um, that you brought up, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> and Randy was there too last night. We went to the Kitts um, neighborhood house for a um, open house with the city bureaucrats about the Broadway plan. So what became what started as two towers per block near the um, Broadway area transport hub has turned into um, as many as you want. So my brother lives on West Eighth. He's got two tower. Um, rezoning applications on his block. One is two doors down, one is across the street. And um, they are dem evicting all the tenants um, when they get their permits and everything, assuming they go ahead. But he's going to have constant construction on his block for three to five years. Easily. Uh, so I, I made a point of, of talking to the staff about what are they doing for noise mitigation both during construction 
And once all these towers go up, are any of the developers or is anyone required to think about noise mitigation? Yeah. Because as soon as you build a tower, you go up more than four stories, you can hear any, everything from the street. Mm -hmm. So you have busy Broadway. They want to put commercial spaces in the those uh, um, uh, twenty story towers on Eighth Avenue and other formerly quiet streets. So you're going to have a cafe um, where people are sitting out and they'll have their music going, and you're going to have people driving there all the time and picking up groceries. Um, so they're turning all the streets into commercial streets and there will be no respite so you'll be in these towers you won't be able to open your windows um you'll hear every sound that goes by um on the i don't know if you know where the squamish reserve is ingrid near barrard bridge well they're building 12 towers um it's an uh, indigenous development and one of them is like literally feet from the barrard bridge oh wow yeah, I mean, and they say, oh, well, we got three pane windows <laughs> as yeah. if that's going to mitigate anything. Yeah. So there's no consciousness at all in this whole development plan of the noise that will be created for the residents of the towers and the residents of mm -hmm. the neighborhood who are, are, are left to deal with all these towers that are coming in. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I tried to get the point across to and I invited um, one of the made chief planners to come to this meeting and um, I'll send him the video afterwards. <laughs> but it, you know, this is Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it, it is an uphill battle. I, I cannot say that it isn't. And I cannot say that sometimes I sit there with my head in my hands and go, Oh, my goodness, you know, will we win? Will we be able to do something? But um, I know that if we don't do anything, we know nothing's going to change. Um, and that's also where I, I look at, like our cities were built to look good, not sound good. Concrete is a reflecting surface. Glass is a reflecting surface. Pavement is a reflecting surface. So back to Victoria's point about the, the noise canyons, downtown Toronto, it's crazy. I get, I have recorded 85 decibel spikes on the 54th floor of a condo, you know, and to me, I do it on the balcony because we should be able to sleep with our windows open. If nothing else, we should be able to sleep with the windows open because many people don't have air conditioning. And if we have our heat, like temperatures are rising, the city of Toronto bakes. And if people are not able to open their windows and cool, then we have a whole other health emergency. Um, so I, I look at how how our cities sound and there's ways, there's things that we can do, um, whether it's a soft car, like there's shrouds that they actually can put over buildings that happens in Europe because sometimes you, I mean, you're not going to rebuild a new building. So there's mitigation techniques, but it needs to get into the building standards. It needs, to, and that's where noise is planning and housing. Um, and I, I, I've showed up at planning and housing and they're like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, well, it's noise, man, and, and indoor noise. We have people that are residents of Toronto Public Community Housing. Those things apparently were built out of paper because noise travels from all four sides. You can get noise, you know, up, downside, all, all of it. So I, I wish I had easy answers, and, and I don't. Um, all I know is that people equals power and creating that community and then focusing. So, Randy, you had a question. Of, you you kind of mentioned Metro Toronto, Greater and all the different populations and all of that. So I just want to loop back to that because um, find out where your where you have the best traction and then focus there. And people will want you to, you know, like, um, so my mom lived in Surrey. And then she was out in White Rock, grew up in Richmond, you know, so it was it was like, so if you can get traction, because where density is happening the most is where people will be most affected, both because of the how the buildings are built, but you got a lot of people. And if you can get on Facebook groups that are in those communities, they are affected and then gradually, you know, have a newsletter. What I what I get people to do is go to nomorenoisetoronto.com and get that newsletter. And it's all work, but that's how you can get people to come on side. And I'm just seeing a, um, a construction site in Japan. You know, there are ways to reduce noise in Japan is apparently one of the one of the more quieter places and they, they're super dense, you know, so it's um, 
Um, focus on where you think you can get the biggest bang for your buck and where you will make the biggest impact and where you can have the most people who are engaged. We have, so we've got Toronto center and then we've got Etobicoke, North York and Scarborough. Those areas are underrepresented in my data for a number of reasons. A lot of newcomers go there. A lot of English as the second language goes there. A lot of people who come from other countries where they didn't trust the government and so they don't want anything to do with civic politics live there. And so that's where in this media event that I'm having on July 8th, I'm inviting people from that area to come and speak. Um, and I'm going to do, I've, I've applied for a grant to have a, a library speaking tour where I go and I educate people about sound. Some people, I mean, if they've come from a really loud city, they come here and they go, oh, this is a piece of cake, man, I've been sleeping on the roads of Mumbai or whatever, right? <laughs> so, so perspective makes a difference, but it's also when people, we've been told to shut up for so long and we've been told that we're gonna get used to it. And now the science and the data shows that health, that noise impacts our health. And that is something we can always, always come back to because all of us have the right to a healthy environment and that was passed i believe federally i want to say bill c3 2030 or something like that i keep meaning to have that off the top of my head but we have a right to a non-toxic environment and in some documents noise is described as a toxin i think that's a beautiful way to close uh <laughs> with the, the statement there ingrid thank you um I uh, also from I, I involved in a lot of different policy related issues at diff different levels. And one thing I uh, think I'm thinking lately is that democracy around the world is under pressure uh, and there Canada is not yet North Korea. Uh, we do have tools of democracy uh, there. There's government legislation. There's different levels of government, mm -hmm. but it's the people the the, the 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 individual people and groups of people who really uh, should uh, have power in determining how how our country is run and how you know how things work. So, um, but it come it requires organizing and uh, having focus and using technology and all that stuff. So, um, I think we've gone a bit over. But uh, I thank you to everyone. Most of the people stayed on for the whole thing. Uh, thank you to Ingrid uh, for the presentation uh, and your time, and for Elvira for the support for getting this all together and promotion. Um, and uh, we should definitely stay in touch um, and link up for across yes. the country. Yes. So um, I think uh, we, yeah, so we'll send out a report and we can still communicate. People can join the, the uh, email list that we have for the task force. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, any final words by Elviva there or Ingrid before we go? My, um, my final word is thank you and keep <laughs> going. Um, Yes, and thank you, Ingrid. It was uh, great meeting you in Toronto and and having this all work out. So I'm really pleased about that, and hopefully we can kind of digest what's happened here. And then um, those of who, people who want to meet again in the next little while, um, we can kind of try and plan some strategy going forward. Um, mm -hmm. so. Absolutely. Okay, so I'll save the chat, and then um, we'll do a report. In fact, if anyone would like to volunteer to write up the report or help me with that, then uh, please send me an email. Um, yeah, we can we can get uh, get a transcript and somebody could just put it into bullet points or something. So yeah, please send an email if you'd like to help with that. Spread yeah, the Randy, we, we need to have this put this up on the city hall watch um, YouTube on channel YouTube, too. YouTube, yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. For the people who weren't able to make it, we can send them the link. There you yeah, go. We'll do. Okay. Well done, you guys. Thank you so yeah. much. You had a great turnout today. Yeah. Being thank here. you, Ingrid. And thank you, everybody. All righty. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Sleep well. <laughs> you too. Thank you. <laughs>